infrastructure is crumbling and the problems are only getting worse. The pressure to find solutions is hot. Let's talk about why American cities have no water, no electricity, and no money to fix their infrastructure problems. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast, hosted by Chad Smelter. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. My name is Chad Smelter. I am your host. Today's guest is Susan Marie Chin Taylor, who's with Creative Raven and the Doo Doo Divas Smells Like Money podcast. Thanks for joining me, Susan. And thanks for asking me to be on the show, Chad. I want to thank you because you got me here in podcasting. When you, yeah, when you first did the introduction or you know, got me on your podcast, I was like, this is a great way to talk about problems and that's you know solutions and infrastructure so thank you so much for joining me and it's an honor to uh, have you here oh well, my pleasure <laughs> so how did you get started in marketing like wh- how did you get started in this industry okay well marketing it goes way 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 back okay but in this industry i i had my own agency and one morning i just woke up and looked in the mirror and said oh god this is just not fun anymore and decided I needed to change. And so at the time I was living in Palm Springs. And if you know anything about that area, it's mainly a resort community. There isn't much industry. And this interesting ad popped up in the newspaper and it said, Palm Springs regional high tech company seeking marketing consultant. So I said, hmm, okay, well, I'm gonna go check that out. I, I wasn't even aware there were any high tech manufacturers in the Valley. So went for the interview and lo and behold, it was with a CCTV camera equipment manufacturer by the name, some people may be familiar with this name, PearPoint, which Mm -hmm. then got bought out by Radio Detection, which subsequently got bought out by SPX and it's now under that, you know, Q's SPX umbrella. But anyway, um, walked into that interview and I was in there for three hours. And wow. at the conclusion of it, I, I said to the owner, Alan Sefton, and his general manager, Tom Schmant, I said, you don't need a consultant to do what you want to do or what your goals are. I really, truly believe you need a full-time person leading the charge to take you where you want to go. And he said, well, we'd like to have you. Would you be willing to do that? And I said, well, perhaps make me an offer I can't refuse. And sure enough, came back like two days later and he put an offer on the table. Um, I segued out of my business, sold my book of business to my subcontractors. And that was 1998. And that's how I started in the industry. Six months in, I realized this was home for life. No matter what happened, I was so completely in love not just with CCTV technology, but I think where I, what really happened to me is I fell in love with the people in the industry. Mm. I fell in love with nice. the customers. I fell in love with my you know, associates and other people that were part of the industry because they are yeah. just salt of the earth. If you're familiar with the computer term, WYSIWYG, they are truly what you see is what you get. Yeah. And there was a, and and before I'd come into this industry, I was in the pharmaceutical specialty healthcare and medical device arena. So Ooh. I'm used to marketing high tech. I love dealing with complex subject matter. It's just something that I really, really enjoy. But the vibe of that was completely different than civil infrastructure and wastewater and trenchless. Yeah. And I just it was a welcome change. I just, yeah, it was like, okay, this is it. Yeah. Cause isn't that industry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you up, but the medical field is a very competitive industry. I mean, you're trying to get in front of doctors and sell technology. Is that how that process works? It, it, it is. And, you know, highly competitive, you've got to protect patents and, and in some ways, depending on what you're bringing to market, it's very, very similar to what we have to deal with in marketing to municipalities and contractors in, in some ways, they're very anxious for new technology, but in other ways, they're slow adopters just like we are because it's a high risk mm. factor because you're mm. dealing with people's lives. Oh, yeah. I that try something sense. and it doesn't quite work. Yeah. I could be open up to lawsuit. Oh, yeah. And so it, that the, the medical device, that part of the industry, I did not enjoy as much as the very specialized healthcare. And I did, I did some really interesting work with 
a company that provided infusion therapy services in mm. conjunction with visiting nurses for very critically ill people that instead of make, forcing them to go to the hospital for treatment, they could have their treatment delivered at home where they were going to be more comfortable. And so yeah. that was kind of like that same kind of, you know, getting to work with a company that's making a difference that is kind of warm and fuzzy. Yeah. It's doing something that's good for the world rather than just trying to sell a product or a right. service. That's kind of how I view wastewater and the wastewater industry as a whole is that the people that are in this, you're my unsung heroes. I'm just shouting that out to anybody that says, you are my unsung heroes. You are truly the superheroes of this planet because without the work that you do on a daily basis, the sacrifices you make when there are emergencies out in the street, it would not allow us to enjoy the lifestyle that we do in a developed nation. And, and yeah. around the world, anybody that has developed infrastructure that is a developed nation that has people to do what you know the folks in our industry do around the world, we take it for granted. Right. Yeah, we do. We very do. underground utilities, out of sight, out of mind, water, sewer, all that stuff is. is every just, time we flush the toilet, every time we turn on the tap, we time. take it for granted. Yeah. And you know, is if you can see behind my, I'm gonna move here. Wait, wait, wait. Wrong way. All right, by my head here. Okay, <laughs> I have a real strong tie to India, and in that I have an office in Bangalore. Okay. With mission, my personal mission was to bring needed wastewater and water technology, India and into India into places that need it desperately, which pretty much everywhere. Yeah. And I'm on the precipice of doing that with someone that actually that I met through LinkedIn that has a, a similar mission. And so it's it takes a long time. But again, we take it for granted. You spend any time in a third world country. And I'll tell you, you will never take your toilet for granted again. I bet you. I bet. And then that's a we when we have to use a porta potty at a construction site. Yeah. Let me tell you. You have no idea what it's like when you travel in back country in a place like India. You, wow. you will never, ever take that toilet for granted again. I bet. Yeah, I haven't done or experienced any of that yet, but yeah. I can only imagine. And it's a developing country, which is a great opportunity for you. I mean, oh, it, it is. I, I would say for anybody that wants to expand, you have to do it carefully in India because, you know, they talk about it and they're very open about it. There's a lot of corruption yeah. to get contracts. There's a lot of corruption. They're very, very upfront about it. Okay, um, whereas other nations, um, everybody <laughs> knows it's there. Everybody <laughs> knows it's there, but they just don't like. They kind of sweep it under the rug or they keep it very covert. Whereas right. it's, like, it's it's in your face. So it's important if you're going to enter any type of country, especially a developing nation that you do it with the right channel partners and you do it with locals on the ground that understand how the game is played. Otherwise you could get taken for a lot of money and nothing will ever very happen. You know, nothing will happen. Luckily right. I have, I have strong ties. I happen to be married to a Gujarati Indian. So, you know, I have those pers you know, those personal connections to help people segue and to go into international development in that area. But it is a great market I went to a seminar a number of years ago, probably at least 10 years ago. Yeah. And the gentleman said to the audience, all right, how many of you plan to go to India and just kind of explore business opportunities? Stan, please. And there were probably about 30 of us that stood up. And he says, okay, remain standing if you plan on establishing a presence or an office in India to do business and really, you know, try to do business in India. And there were about six of us left standing. I was one of them and hasn't happened yet, but I'm, I, I haven't lost hope. And he said, all right, everybody, I want you to turn and take a look at these six people who are still standing. You're looking at the world's next billionaires. Yeah. Because if you do it right, it's an emerging market and there is opportunity and there is need. And because they have no technology for sanitation, they have some, but there's, you know, problems. And, and that, that would be, that would be an episode for another time. The challenge <laughs> right. of doing, you know, doing wastewater in India. It's, it, there's a lot of cultural things it's beyond, beyond the corruption and government, but right. uh, that it takes patience and it takes tenacity but they are very, very open 
much mm. more than we are because they don't have anything. They have nothing to lose. Of right. Okay, let's try this. Let's wow. try this. That they are not satisfied. They realize that there is a problem now. Unfortunately, it's taken many, many years to get to the point where now the problems of the country are affecting the very wealthy. And so once things start to affect the wealthy, something starts to happen because oh, yeah. they're going to stomp their feet and say, oh, no, 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 no. I am not down with this. I, this is absolutely unacceptable. I'm yeah. living in a $2 million flat in Mumbai and I have to come out. And when I go grocery shopping, I have to walk through two feet of floodwaters that have live sewage in it. No, sorry, not going to do it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's, that's, a, like I said, it's, it's another podcast. All in yeah, itself. no doubt. No doubt. I wasn't sure where that was going to go, but it, it, that's a, that's, man, that is a great position for you to be in now, you know, just as a way to kind of help uh, American technology get into India, you know, it was a great, place for you to be to bridge that gap. I mean, I, right. I, I, that and, and there, it isn't without yeah. risk and right. you may not make a tremendous amount of money at first, but um, if anybody's interested, I have a, a video on my homepage entitled creating wind windows of opportunity. Yeah. And it was really about my mission and what I saw as the opportunity that we're going to do well by doing good. Yeah. If you do good, if you go into any venture like this with the attitude of, First and foremost, I want to be of service. I want to contribute. I want to do good for others. The money always comes. Yeah. And that's something that I've seen in my whole life in business as an entrepreneur is that if I keep to that pay it forward attitude, when I need the help, yeah. it will show up without my even asking. Right. And sometimes from the most... Um, unexpected and surprising places. Yeah. Yeah. You never know. That's the way it goes. Yeah. I, you know, being an entrepreneur, that's, it, it opens up a lot of different doors, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's, that's the greatest thing about being an entrepreneur. You can think one thing and then all of a sudden you're in something else down the road. <laughs> it's just a lot of opportunities there. So how would you, let's talk about marketing. Um, okay. It's from when you started marketing, you know, you have, been in this game for a long time versus what are what's happening now. Can you go through some of the marketing challenges and changes in the, in the last couple of decades? Oh gosh, it, <laughs> it's evolved tremendously. Yeah. Um, it used to be all about print. It, yeah. it used to be all about brochures, not to say the trade shows aren't important and they are. Right. Uh, but now it's, less about the hype and more about the educating. It's less about the gimmick and making sure that the message is really all about what is in it for the prospect or the customer. Yeah. So I've seen this shift. We are in such a fast paced society. We are constantly on. I mean, yeah. having our cell phones with us, we can't shut off. And so we have limited amounts of time. We're being, so much more is being demanded of us to get done in a day because we have all these tools to make us much more efficient. Mm -hmm. So folks have less and less time to weed through all of the muck. They want to they cut, cut right to the chase. And no matter whether you're selling a box of bananas or a CCTV camera, or a lateral replacement to a homeowner or a new car. Yeah. The only thing that that person that's going through their mind, that person that is across the table from you is, okay, so what's in it for me? That's all they care about. And they don't care how great you are. They don't care about your history. They, they really, pardon my French, but they just don't give a damn. They yeah. want to know, one, how are you going to make their life easier? Are you going to make them more money? Are you going to give them more time? Are you going to make them feel better? You know, are you going to help them lose weight? Are you going to give up, you know, whatever it is, how yeah. are you going to make my life better? Yeah. Or my company, my company better. That's really, but it, it sometimes it really equates down to how's it going to impact me? Yeah, right. it's from my company, but the bottom line, they're really just thinking about, you know, MMI, me, myself, and I. Oh, yeah. And we're being educated more by giving people good 
relevant, useful content. Mm-hmm. Don't sell me. Help me first. Right. Be of service to me first. Show me that you know what it is you know. Give me something that I can actually use. I think the biggest challenge right now is, you know, we call it BC, before COVID and now after COVID, you know, we, that yeah. things have changed dynamically and is not going to go back to where it was before. It's just not. It's not. It's not. We have now moved into a virtual selling environment. Virtual selling and marketing is very different and it's much more challenging. And one of the mm. things that I'm finding with my clients who are co- who've come from that, you know, that old world have been in this industry 30, 40 years, they're really struggling with that shift on mm. how they now need to communicate with their customers and prospects to keep themselves top of mind. New blood is coming in, you know, mm-hmm. as we're getting this over tsunami, the old, the old dogs are, you know, sewer rats are retiring out. We've got new blood coming in, younger people and how they like to receive information. So a brochure isn't going to do it. Just a website isn't going to do it. Unless your website has an amazing user experience. And we can get into that. That is that is yeah. one thing that has really shifted that everybody needs to focus, focus on. Even if you're not doing any social media or content marketing or PR, well, everybody should be doing PR. But if you're just relying really on your website, I would suggest to everybody, work with a professional that does this. I want on my team, but it, you know, don't have to work with me, but anybody that does user experience audits where they go through your website and do an audit of what's the experience like when someone comes into your website. Right. Does it perform where it's going to make them want to engage with you? Is there something compelling? Does it load fast? Does it have enough for someone to make an educated decision or be incited enough to go, oh, this is kind of cool. I want to dig further and find out what that is. And when you get a report like that, sometimes you're going to bristle at it and it's going to make you feel very uncomfortable because you feel it's your website, it's your baby, it's your front facing electronic salesperson. And then Come to find that maybe you haven't been doing quite as good a job as you could have been on this website. And it can make you feel very uncomfortable. But sometimes just a few changes can make the difference between that email box filling up and that phone ringing. Huge difference. Huge difference. Content marketing and PR. If you're not doing something in the social media sphere with digital marketing and have a strong social media presence, if you're dealing with consumers, you've got to be on, you know, Instagram and Facebook because that's consumer marketing. Yeah. If you're doing business marketing, you've got to be B2B. You've got to be on LinkedIn. And I hear a lot of people sometimes like, oh, I don't know what to do, Suzanne. <laughs> well, you've got to start somewhere. Right. You've got to start somewhere. These are the challenges that if you do not get on board with this, you're going to become a dinosaur. Yep. And your competition who is involved in this, they're going to be eating your lunch. I was just going to say, they're going to eat you alive. Yeah. No, there's just, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Go ahead. Because I would say in giving advice to to listenership here is that one surefire way with marketing now, with the trends in marketing, to really ensure your longevity and your sustainability and your viability is you have to be utilizing the digital marketing tools that are out there. Yeah. And you got to be creative. Uh, it's not just about being digital, using digital marketing tactics like we have been. You have to actually be creative. Like you have to come up with an identity for your company and yes. what that's going to look like. It's that's that's the way we're heading. It's I tell people this all the time. I'm, come up with your vision, your mission, and what your company's about, and start promoting that from within. You know, um, but it's it's, it's a struggle out there. So what? what Kind of reversing topics now, since we talked about your, your your marketing from historic to what it is now. Why do you love marketing? <laughs> I'm a storyteller. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you're good. I, yeah, I'm a storyteller. 
I'm an entertainer. I'm I'm a professionally trained vocalist. Um, here's an inter interesting factoid about me. Uh, I got a scholarship to a very prestigious institute of music, and I was going to study to become an opera singer. Really? And my vocal teacher and coach said to me, she had been a retired opera diva. She had been with the Cleveland Opera Company and she has sung on, as, a, as a guest on many, many prestigious stages. And she said to me, you have it, but you have to be willing to sacrifice your life for your art if you really want to get to that top level. If anybody mm -hmm. knows opera like Beverly Sills, Luciana Pavarotti, you know, any any one of the greats, Sumi Joe, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, operate at that level, your art will become everything. Mm -hmm. You really won't have much of a personal life. So decide what you want to do. Yeah. And I really had to think about it. And I decided that, no, I did not want to live that life that, you know, she had lived, although it looked glamorous. There were a lot of sacrifices and decided I want to go into something else. Yeah. So uh, my parents did not want me going into marketing and uh, advertising and graphic design, which is, I was very artistic because they said, oh, you'll never make any money at that. So what did they do? They pushed me into business administration and accounting of all things. Oof. So I was an accountant. Do I sound like an accountant? Do I even look like an accountant? No. <laughs> uh, for, I did that for quite a long time. And then I had a, an opportunity. God rest his soul with my late husband. I was in a very serious automobile accident. We're kind of digressing back into my background here, but got into a serious automobile accident. I was disabled for nine months. Hmm. He said to me, you know, you hate accounting. You've always wanted to do this. He says, here's an opportunity to maybe take the time to shift while you're laid up. How about I buy you a computer, get you some tutorials. And this was back in the days when the big layout program, we're, I'm dating myself here, was all this page maker. And now, now that's part of Adobe. You're probably even too young to remember. I don't that. even know all what this, that is. <laughs> all this page maker, which is okay. now InDesign. You know, anybody who knows Adobe, it was InDesign. Yeah. I was using Photoshop when it originally started out as a plugin for Illustrator. That's how many wow. years I've been using the software, okay? Oh, nice. And so it gave me an opportunity to get into a field that I always wanted to explore, and I never looked back. But one thing that I do want to thank my parents for is that accounting background really has served me well as a creative because a lot of creatives, they're very good at their art, but they're not good at running a business because they don't mm. understand and numbers. Just like mm. there's a lot of contractors out there in our industry who <laughs> they're really good field technicians, but when they decide to launch on their own, they have a very, very hard time being profitable sometimes because they don't understand how to look at the numbers. Right. And so I've been very blessed by having that background Yeah. because it, yeah, it's, I know what it takes to make my nut and put the key in the door and open it every day in this studio. Yeah. And so that in a way has served me really, really well. But yeah. we we kind of we kind of digress there. Sorry, went down. No, the no, it's perfect. No, those are the things that, you know, I was going to ask you what your parents, which parent like motivated you the most and like guided you uh, and was like your you know mentor, so to speak. I would say my dad. My dad, dad. was a PhD in chemistry, taught at the university level. OK. And I think that's where I get that. You know, he was a scientist. and I'm, No, I'm not a scientist, but. My dad was probably one of the most amazing educators and lecturers. And I'm not just saying this because he was my dad, yeah. but his students would bump into me in on the street because we lived in Philadelphia and it was a very small community where we lived. And they'd say, oh my God, you're Doc Solomon's daughter. And they said, I just have to tell you, your father was the best teacher that I had in the whole five years that I was at PCPS. And I was like, really, why? And they said, because his style of teaching. Hmm. And so when I do keynote speaking and when I've recorded and put together my e-courses on marketing for the industry, mm -hmm. I remember my father saying, you need to say it, then you need to visualize it and put it on the board, and then you need to say it and then involve engagement so that it touches on the, all three ways that people learn. Yeah. 
And that kind of ties into yeah. neuro-linguistic programming, which I had no idea. My father didn't even know about that. But, you know, he was spouting and using the principles of that before any of us even knew what NLP was. Yeah. And that was that some of us are auditory, some of us are visual, and some of us are kinesthetic where we have to learn by doing. And right. so he incorporated that in to all of his teaching. And that's mm -hmm. what I believe made him such a fabulous teacher because he met all of his students where they were at. And that kind of circles back to content when we were talking about marketing. Yeah. You can't just do static blog content. You need to do a mix of video short form, which is bullet points, a little bit of animation, and then a video because people learn different ways. They and do. so if you deliver your, your topic, like if you decide on a topic, create content around that topic in three different formats, because then you're going to have the best possible chance of being in front of or catching the attention of as many eyes in your prospect database that you're trying to catch because right. now you're delivering education to them about who you are the way that they want to receive it not the way that you're comfortable delivering it yeah but suzanne i have the best lining project product out there i'm just going to promote my product i just want to promote the product <laughs> so, that's, that. that. that's what that. i use i, I see it all the time I can, I can care less what i want to know is you have the best lining product out there okay so no one cares show me a video, show me a video of the problem that it solved Get okay. a client, get a client to talk on video. Yep. And yep. one of the things is um, I did a little webinar and I think it may still be available on replay on LinkedIn. It was called 25 B2B content mistakes that are costing you customers and money hmm. and what you can do to fix it. And one of, one of the tips that I tell people is make your customer the hero and tell stories about them. So subliminally, they're the hero of the story but you're the star. Yeah, it's true. Story. When you were saying, how do, what do I love about marketing? We now with digital marketing have the ability in this medium that we have not had ever, ever before in the decades that I've been doing marketing to store, to actually bring stories to life right. in an engage, engaging. And I love the coin, the phrase edutaining manner. Edutaining. I like edutaining. it. Edutaining. Edutaining. Everybody wants to be entertained. <laughs> you know, we started MTV and, and, and it's, we are an instant gratification society. It's, it's sad. But that's, how many times, and, and this is true because I, I get trapped into myself. I go looking for one subject on YouTube and I find it and I'm viewing it. Okay, that's great. And then the next topic comes up behind it. There's little shorts that are down there and I'm watching it. One of the things I love is the talent because I'm a singer. I love watching the talent auditions on Britain's Got Talent or America's Got Talent or Idol and, yeah. I, and the voice. And, what, and so next thing I know, I'm sucked down the rabbit hole <laughs> and I'm on that stupid phone <laughs> watching videos for two hours. And I look at the oh. clock. Oh my God, it's 11 o'clock. I really need to get to bed. So it's, that's how digital marketing and digital content works. Yeah. Suck them in, give them a little dopamine drip and have them wanting more. It's not good enough to just do one video and then be silent on digital marketing or your social media. Feed for you. you have to be consistent, persistent, and frequent. Those are the yeah, words. I, I honestly... I honestly don't understand how our industry has survived as long as it has, because we have never leveraged all of our assets. Uh, you know, I talk about this stuff all the time. The salespeople never leverage their digital assets. They're not programmed to do that. And this industry, for some reason, wants to stay under the radar or out of sight, out of mind, just like the sewer pipes and water pipes are. I'm like, guys, <laughs> if you don't this talk really about good it, Check, I mean, that's I really what it is. I don't, I don't think it's that they want to. What I hear when I talk together, this, this e-course that I've got, yeah. is people will come to me and say, Suzanne, I don't have a huge budget. I know I need to do something in digital marketing. But honest God, I just don't understand it. Uh, I can tell you about trenchless relining all day long, but this digital marketing thing, I don't understand it. I don't know where to begin. And I'm confused. 
And there's so much information coming at me from so many different places that what is the right information? Right. And, and, and I think that's what it is, is that, that, what is it? Analysis by paralysis that they want to do something, but they're getting so much input that they don't know where to begin. Yeah. So I heard it and I said, you know, I need to make this easy for folks in the industry. So I put together this course and I, I entitled it the DIY digital marketing playbook for yeah. wastewater pros. And now that's kind of evolved that it's not so much, I realize it's not so much a DIY, but it's more of a done with you, not a do it yourself right. in that we can help you put together through, through the course, this digital game plan. And I think that's what it is, is you, you need to get out of your head and just take it step by step. And just like you would develop a business plan for your brick and mortar business and how you're going to do trenchless, how you're going to find your next client, you know, um, whatever you're going to do, you need to put your digital content and your, you have to create a roadmap. Yeah. Just like you put together a scope of work or, or right. project execution. Okay. How am I going to do this project? Yeah. You need to approach digital marketing in much the same way. You need to fill out forms. You need to analyze it. You need to do a little bit of homework. You need to figure out, okay, I, I get in front of my computer and say, oh my God, what am I going to talk about today? And I call that right. the white screen of death. But you don't have to suffer with that. If you put together an editorial calendar of here's what I'm going to talk about for the month of May. Here's what I'm going to talk about for the month of June. And here, here's who's in my company is, is going to talk about that and make yeah. them accountable. And you make a schedule that is doable for you. And then the second part of it is find help. You got that information in your head. Right. And just because you have it in your head, it doesn't mean if you're not a writer, then don't try to force yourself being a writer. Because if you're not, what's going to happen is you're just going to stop dead in your tracks and you're never going to get it done because you know you're not a writer and you're just going to say, okay, this is too much. No. Enlist the help of a writer. And it is so economical right now to do this. I that, yeah. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. I was, I've, I've, just because I've been in this industry just long, you know, long enough to understand how business should be done. Uh, we, we have never figured out how to run a business correctly in contracting. Um, there's millions of people, millions of people now on social media, online all the time. And we just, we can't, get out of the, and I say we, as in the same industry, sewer and water, because I've been in this space as a salesperson developing business. I spent so much time and energy just traveling one meeting, two, three meetings a, a day, right? It's, it's only two or three meetings a day. Now I'm, you can get six meetings a day, yes. eight meetings a day. You can get, it's nuts. It's nuts. I don't understand how we're still doing this like I get face to face. You have to have that when it's a done deal. You want to seal the deal. Like it's a last meeting. You got to get there. Totally get it. But if you're engaging in cold calling and you're engaging in just setting the prospecting up, it's easy to do online now. You can just get all this stuff done ahead of time and, and be more productive. And, and it seems like we're just stuck in our old ways. And sorry, I went on a rant there. But oh, no, no, no. I, I agree exactly with you. what's going on. I agree with you. And, and I think the industry has to realize when it comes to sales and this shift into the virtual is that people are now going to do their due diligence and come down to the short list on who they're going to maybe invite to bid on a contract or yep. what technology they're going to consider or what equipment they're going to buy, tools they're going to buy, software, whatnot. They're going to vet that first digitally. They're right. going to do the work online. They're going to look for content. They're going to look up reviews. And then they're going to reach out and they're going to want to have a virtual meeting and they're going to want a demo or they're going to want to see something. And then when they get that short list, then and only then are when the face-to-face -face meetings are going to take place. Right. So how are you going to get to that place where you're on the short list? Yeah. The only way that you're going to get on that short list, it's that buying cycle. The buying decision cycle has, it has changed dynamically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now you need to make sure there's five stages. It's they have a problem and they've heard of a solution. Step two, they're going to go research that solution and look at the benefits and see if it's a good fit. Right. Third, 
They're going to reach out to those ones that they think are the best fit, get some more due diligence and do their homework. Fourth, they're going to narrow it down and negotiate. And then fifth, they're going to give the contract. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are not publishing content and you are not <laughs> active and frequent and being seen when they are at stage one and two and even three, okay, yeah. you are not going to have a seat at the table when they are at steps three, two, like the last, the last couple steps when they're signed on the contract, you, you won't even be a blip on the radar. hundred percent. So, so this is what people in our industry have to realize is that out of sight, remember what he was saying out of sight, <laughs> out of mind, you've got to be top of mind. And it's yep. especially important in a long sales cycle industry where we're talking about, for the most part, capital improvement and right. capital equipment purchase. A short sales cycle, and you know, and I know it, if we could say six months, everybody goes, really? Where do yeah. you have a six month? Oh, I bet. I would love it. You know, that's like we're going to yeah. have a six month sales cycle. On average, it's 12 months to 18 months to 18. two years. Yep. So how are you going to keep that person on the hook and still interested in you? For those when you don't post anything. <laughs> Months, okay, until they're ready to buy, right? Content, yeah. and I'm not talking about content or reaching out with a newsletter that says, "Hey, you ready to buy now?" You know, like or like got a, a guy in New York with the watches and his jacket going, "Hey, buddy, want to buy a watch?" No, yeah. that it's not. No, you've got to very softly stay top of mind with content that basically establishes you, yeah, as the authority in the space as and, the thought leader as someone that's really interested in i'm giving you some information to help you be an educated buyer even if you don't choose me and i'm not the right fit i hope that what i've given you helps you here's here's one quick thing to point out uh susan great points all around uh is that one thing i've seen in the digital marketing space is these companies are hiring uh, marketing firms outside of the industry. And that that's a huge problem. Uh, I've watched the content coming out and I'm like, that does nothing. Like that doesn't even tell you like what's going on. You know, uh, I'm sure you can elaborate a little bit on that. And we have only got like a couple more minutes. So Steph, yeah, I, I, I call it, I call it fluff. I know you like this one. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I call it fluff. And it's because this industry is unlike any other B2B or B2C yep. industry that you will ever, ever encounter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been in a lot, I've been doing marketing since I, mm, three decades, over three decades now. Yeah. Not going to give away my age. Uh, <laughs> it's, and I have seen a lot of changes. I've worked, like I said, I've worked in a lot of different industries. This is a unique beast. Yeah. It, it's a unique beast. And unless that person who you are hiring understands how marketing is done in this industry. Mm -hmm. You come from that procurement side. I mean, you know, procurement inside oh, yeah. and out, how procurement is done, yep. specsmanship selling, but more than that, the terminology and what the end user wants to hear and see in that copy and that information and what is important Unless that person that is working with you is a civil engineer or has maybe worked for a city, has done this work and has shifted careers. Right. They are going to be completely clueless. Lost. Yes, they may be inexpensive, but you're going to wind up spending hours and hours rewriting content. Yep. Sending back feedback about a, a video edit like, no, that wasn't important, but this is you're going to spend lots and lots of time as a business owner redoing work. Whereas if you work with someone that comes from the industry, writes for the industry, so much easier. Talks for the industry, um, you're just going to get your content from point A to point B and out the door to published right. that much faster. Now, if you can't afford to hire an agency, Get some education, 
work with a, this is one reason why I told you I developed this course and coaching program right. is that you don't try to do it alone. Maybe you don't have the, the budget to hire someone at $3,500, $44,000 a month, but you can do this with some help on your own if you're willing to put in the time. And yep. I think that the money that you're going to invest in doing digital marketing right for this industry, don't expect results right away, but nine months down, you're going to start to see an uptick and it becomes like a snowball effect yep. where... You know, I started out four years ago, I had 892 connections on LinkedIn. I now have over 9,000 yeah. and I've done it all organically with content. Yeah. And I think podcasts are a great, great venue. If you don't want to do your own, try yeah. to become a guest on other people's podcasts because it's a way for you to showcase, again, your authority in your space and yep. that you're a thought leader and you really know what you're talking about. Yep. You're someone that I can trust. You're you're spot on, Susan. I mean, that's it. We just closed the deal. <laughs> it's uh, honestly, uh, I know we ran out of time here, but uh, it's okay. This is I mean, awesome. like I said, Jed, I, yeah. I can talk about this. It's I'm I passionate. Know, I'm passionate yeah. about it. Yep. Our industry is so vital and so important. It is. And the story has to be told. And you're so right. And, uh, you know, towards the end here, how can people get a hold of you, Susan? What's the best way to reach out? Because you offer a lot of value. So uh, you, my website is Creative Raven, just like it sounds. Uh, my email is Raven at Creative Raven. I would invite people to reach out to me on LinkedIn. If you look up my profile under my name, Suzanne Marie Chin Taylor with a hyphen. And uh, also we've got the podcast. Check that out. Uh, find yeah. me on LinkedIn. I Welcome. Lots and lots of connections. Um, I also have another thing. We didn't talk about this, but uh, I have a training division called the to it group, which stands nice. for train, understand, improve, transform kind of on the play on get around to it. And this is where we have courses for the industry, for workforce development, for digital marketing and our latest one. And I have to, cause I think this is very, very exciting is that a lot of people have said to me, Suzanne, thank you for helping with the marketing. And now I've got all this new work, but now I've got another bigger prop. And I said, what's that? And they said, I don't have people to do the work. How can I find good people? How can I hire? So I heard that. And we're going to be launching a course just for contractors in our industry called nice. the Gain, Train, Retain Playbook. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Reach out to me. I can put you on the mailing list. It's going to launch in June. We're going to do a free, free intensive workshop about it coming up. So a lot of exciting things, you know, like I said, I, I'm dedicated to this industry. I am a sewer rat. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Love you guys. You are my superheroes. So Love it. Thank you so much Thank for this. This so has much. been great. Uh, Susan, it's been enlightening and all the things you're doing for the wastewater side of the, you know, that industry. And it, it's been great. So Thanks for joining me on the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. It's uh, and, and I, like I said, I, I started this after I got on your show. I was like, I'm gonna start a podcast. This is awesome. Like the best thing. You just got to get out there and, and do it. You got to get uncomfortable. Get to, yeah, I get to meet some of the most interesting people within the industry, and even right. people that are outside of the industry that have cool information to share that could help people in the industry. So yeah. it's uh, labor labor of love, Chad. It is. It is. Well, thank you so much, Susan. Appreciate you thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Have a great day. You too. Thank you for listening to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. We hope that this show brought you some insight on relevant topics within the infrastructure world. Please join us every two weeks on Tuesday for the next episode. If you're interested in being a guest on this podcast, please set up a 15-minute interview with your host at calendly.com slash chadsmeltzer. 